reason for that being that he was the writer of the most of the first systematic economic treatise, thick book called the Investigation of the Principles in Nature of the Wealth of Nations, known in the big abbreviation of Wealth of Nations. So we're going to be talking about Adam Smith's economic theory pertaining to a couple of things. He was the founder. Uh, it's interesting that he was the founder of economics as a systematic science, but he was not awfully original. He was original in a couple of ways, but even his most celebrated theoretical concepts such as division of labor or specialization it begins the book with I don't entirely do or formulate a long time ago by Xenophon in the fourth century BC Athens and then reformulated a couple of times by Plato in his Republic you find the concept of division of labor collaborative pretty Clearly. Then you have in the Islamic the medieval theological and philosophical tradition you know, the concepts of division of labor. And even Zina, the Persian well, 12th century philosopher. So uh, the same applies for a variety of other theoretical contributions that he made. So he was not completely original, but what was what was new, what was significant is the systematic character of this. Adam Smith's theory is the first comprehensive economic system. That means that he unites. His book offers economic theory of all major aspects of economic systems macroeconomics, microeconomics, theory of foreign trade, theory of value and price. As we shall see in a moment, not a particularly good one, but nevertheless a theory of price and value. So that's one significant crucial contribution that will influence economic science afterwards. So when you read people like David Ricardo or Thomas Malthus or John Stuart Mill or Karl Marx, why not? You'll see that all of them try to be systematic thinkers, cover the entire corpus of economic problems. So with Adam Smith, a systematic treatise in economics comes of age. This new type of book, just like the 19th century, the modern novel didn't exist. What is the first novel that they usually say? It's Don Quixote, 17th century. It's the first novel. There hasn't been a novel before Cervantes wrote. Novel, and actually it really got going in the 19th century. It really became a widely practiced artistic form of the 19th century. Something similar <laughs> applies to economics with Adam Smith. So not only that the systematic treatise in economics didn't exist before Adam Smith, economics as a science didn't exist before. That's economics as a science, as a separate science. And an economic treatise. A book that covers that purports to cover that, that has an ambition of covering all significant economic phenomena, from high theory to economic policy. Before Adam Smith, we had, we had many thinkers. People who we call nowadays economists were deeper and more profound economic thinkers to go, continue on. Even some of the Spanish scholastic 
theologians of the 16th and early 17th century in Spain and Italy had, technically speaking, better theories about various aspects of the economic system, including price and value theory. But they never understood themselves as economists. They never thought of economics as a separate body of scientific generalizations, as a separate science. For Spanish theologians, it was an aspect of practical philosophy. It's part of their building a theological system. For people like Hume and Thibault and Pantheon, it was a kind of sideshow, some interesting phenomenon that, that justifies writing here or there a pamphlet or a comment or a short study. So remember John Locke and David Hume and Thibault and Pantheon, all their works that you read are actually single pamphlets or articles or studies that were written on various occasions who ordered by, by a king or by a queen or as a comment on a, on a current political or current political affairs. They were not a part of a systematic tools, a systematic scientific study. So that's that's the innovation part of so that's a model of this approach. They profoundly influenced economics to this day. Interestingly enough, and ironically, in the 19th century, we're going back, we are backtracking from this tradition of economists writing scientific treatises. But now the economic science is much more fragmented, much more pre-classical in, in, in its form, the way our economic theories were uh, presented. So it's now actually I'm one of the very old-fashioned economists who wrote a book about it. So, so what, what is the top level uh, production, the prevailing model of writing the economics is publishing pa paper in a high-ranking scientific journal. That's a model. That's the way of, that, that's what economists do most of the time. If you don't publish in scientific journals, individual pieces, individual um, Articles, papers covering isolated issues, whatever that might be, or trade theory or labor economics and so on, uh, you are not considered, you are not considered particularly serious. So, this overarching ambition to develop a comprehensive economic theory to explain, to explain the the whole of the economic phenomenon and to write books about economics that's now going out of fashion in modern economics. We're going at least in, in, the, in, in the way how economics is formally presented and developed, we're going back to the pre sneaking pre-classical forms. Right. Now it's not uh, it is not the pamphlets and newspaper articles anymore, now it's scientific articles and scientific journals. But the format is the same. 10, 15 pages, treating one isolated issue, the interest rate involved, wages, labor markets. Um, most, most of the production in modern economics is like that. So from, from Adam Smith until about mid-20th century, the prevailing form of economic writing was an economic treatise. Book that wants to explain everything in economics in a consistent coherent fashion. So now, one additional warning here. Adam Smith, we nowadays call Adam Smith the first economist, the guy who established economics as an independent science. What it means is that he uh, separated economics from other social sciences. That is an independent field of study, independent from political philosophy, political theory, ethics, theology, and so on. What do nowadays call value-free science? That's one word of positive science. Positive as opposed not to negative but to normative. Positive as opposed. Normative. 
But interestingly enough, he himself didn't think of himself as an economist. He calls himself moral philosopher. He didn't realize or he didn't seem to consider it important that what he was doing is actually separating economics as a completely separate subject from study. From Aristotle on, economics was a part and parcel of a broader and more important political philosophy. So, at the terminological level, Adam Smith retains the old usage. But when it comes to content, he develops what we can call it. Economics is an independent of science. Adam Smith was also a couple of preliminary editions here. He was a Scotsman. He was a Scotsman. He was a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Close friend of Edmund Burks. And David Hume, and we want to this broader tradition of Scottish Enlightenment that we talked about last time. Relied on empiricist, empirical analysis. Uh, it was not a philosophical, uh, and uh, his economics was not philosophical minded, it was empirical minded. So the small excerpt that you have in your, in your book tells you that, that he's using a lot of examples, a lot of empirical study. He prepared this book for, for 20 years. He collected uh, quite a bit of empirical evidence and examples for, for the theory he developed. But interestingly enough, again, he was also a philosopher. He wrote a book, another book, so he wrote two important books in his life. The most well known and, and celebrated is The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. I only told you this is maybe the most important year in the history of liberty because of what happens in the United States. And this book, the reason now we will see some of the reasons why, why people are inclined to say this. I was quoting actually somebody else who said that. George Stigler, professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Nobel Prize winning economist, he said that 1776 was the most important year in the history of freedom. And our, our task will be partially to try and understand what he might have had in mind. Why would he consider? Uh, it's clear enough for us, we, we, can, we can make sense of why would somebody think that 1776 was one of the most important years in the history of freedom. In the Anglo Saxon world, at least, or probably in the world as well, but it's not quite clear why would publication of the of Nations be also significant. And we will see that there's, there's, there are some reasons to believe that. Although I would say not nearly as much as George Stephen believed. We'll see that Adam Smith is a contradictory figure. One of his contradictions is this. Duality be between his empirically minded economics. He was a guy of, of facts and details and empirical study. Who rejected empty philosophical speculations, sophisters. Very down to a simple man. And also, he was a philosopher who published another book that was very influential. It's called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And this book here is known for not only as a first scientific economic treatise, but maybe for some people even as a Bible of classical liberalism. It's a book that developed some of the most influential arguments for the free markets and limited government and against many forms of government interventionism and protectionism and so on. And it is well known for its advocacy of individual rights and the ideas of individual self-interest as the main engine of economic prosperity. That's the key, or let's say, paradigmatic shift in Adam Smith. 
it's not the, the, the wealth of the kingdom anymore that Mercantil is trying to talk about. That's how to increase the wealth of the state and power of the state on the one hand, and how to incentivize production in the industry. For Adam Smith, it's the question of individual wealth, and it's not sovereignty and interests of producers that should be our main goal in the rise of economic policy, but consumers. And as you will see, he develops some of the most influential Maybe one of the most influential metaphors in history of economics, the metaphor of the invisible hand of the big mouth. So when people say the wealth of nations, there is one catchphrase that covers the main theoretical contribution and the magic and the influence of wealth of nations, the invisible hand. The essence of which is this concept that people left to their own devices with individual initiative and individual uh, profit-seeking behavior will take care of general welfare of everybody much better than if you try as a society to force everybody to act uh, out of altruistic motivations. As if there is some invisible hand that drives people who are motivated by selfish interest to achieve certain goals that are in general interest. We'll see in detail uh, or later on today some specific quotations and uh, the specific meaning of this form. But that's what, what the, this book is known about, known for primarily, especially among non economists. Adam Smith, the founding father of classical liberalism, says invisible hand of the free markets, uh, a heavy handed or, or an iron visible hand of government intervention is bad. So he's seen as a, as, as, as a prophet of individual self-interest. Theory of moral sentiments is a completely different book. It argues that society cannot survive without natural altruistic sentiment and bonds of solidarity. Between sympathy, the virtue of sympathy is, is a genuine inherent characteristic of human nature. It's a philosophical, philosophical book. Europe. Now the head scratcher for everybody, how people decide this or that. And there is an entire literature in, in, in economic philosophy, in history of economic thought, in technical economics, how to reconcile the, the logic and the optics and the arguments of the wealth of nations to the theory of moral sentiments. So this is known sometimes in plus Adam Smith for what? Other state problem. Any good contradiction or apparent contradiction between theory of moral sentiment with its altruistic emphasis, emphasis on, on human sympathy as the main glue that keeps society together, and wealth of nations to individual interest of profits of behavior. And I'll, there are two schools of thought. One, one school is this simple. The guy was confused, or he changed his mind. These two things could not be reconciled. And there are people who say, no, if you look more carefully, if you analyze it more carefully, more deeply, you will see that there are, real, there are, there are ways in which you can reconcile this. But you don't, have, you don't need to go too much into, into the details of this. That's what I'm saying. The one analysis, because we are, we are Interested primarily in history of economic ideas. This book here, by the way, theory of moral sentiments, and you will read it here. You don't have any. I don't think that you have any excerpts from from theory of moral sentiments. <sighs> what else? Uh, yeah, Adam Smith was hugely influential from the very beginning. An entire school of thought. With Adam Smith begins what we nowadays, in retrospect, call classical school of economics. A classical school of economics includes Smith, partially few, 
Chicago, uh, James Neal and John Stuart Neal, father and son. And Karl Marx. These are some of the most important thinkers in this tradition. So, a very, very heterogeneous bunch. They're different people here, but they're connected. Connected not so much by ideology, although some of them have similar ideology. Smith, human and Father, similar ideology, but they also put it different, and that's all on Marx. Connected via their analytical apparatus, theoretical concepts that they use. So one of the things that I would like you very much to learn as a, maybe the most significant thing that you can learn in this class is that you should never confuse final conclusions, political preferences, ideological conclusions that an economist reaches with the means by which he by the analytical content. So that means that Adam Smith, Ricardo, Neil, and Marx are people who, who saw the world fundamentally different in terms of their ideology, their philosophy, and so on. But they use the same concepts and the same theoretical tools to analyze the world, and they reach different conclusions. So what are those analytical tools that Adam Smith was one of Adam Smith was the guy to erect this edifice of classical economics, economics at least to uh, systematize. You will find the same thing in the 20th century. You will see that people of very different political orientations who use the same analytical theories, the same technical concepts. Economics. For example, the concepts of marginal utility and subjective theory of value, or marginal utility of distribution, and so on. You will have Ludwig von Mises and F.A. Hayek and Lionel Robbins, like the Devin Nouveau libertarians, small government people, and you will have Frank Knight, who was an eclectic thinking without any appreciable ideology, and Philip Wicks, the socialist. I think the ideological and related people, they use the same theoretical language and, and discuss economics within the same theoretical tradition. The same thing, the exact same thing applies to classical economics. It is usually associated with classical liberal thought, free market thought, because of the influence of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, to some degree, John Stuart Mill. But that's not the most distinctive feature of this. Analytical content. Theory is the most important aspect. And what is this analytical content? A couple of seemingly very simple aspects. Division of labor, number one. Division of labor, specialization. Number two, theory of value. Labor. Theory of value and cost of production. Application of the division of labor to international trade. Successes and failures of, of this theory are shared by all the members of this group. And that tells you something. That tells you that when a certain theory is developed, it's not very often that the full implications of this theory are well understood. Very often, this is realized much later on, and even more controversially, people understand the final implications of the given theory, fundamentally discrete ways. One classical example is the labor theory of value that Adam Smith discusses, that you will read about. He thought this theory was perfectly consistent with the free market 
system. Fast forward 80 years later, Adam, uh, Karl Marx writes Das Kapital, the cornerstone thesis of which is he also accepts by and large theory of labor and cost of production theory of value taken from Ricardo, just to repackage it slightly modified Adam Smith's theory. And he uses this same theory that Adam Smith considered consistent with free market ideology as a cornerstone of his theory of profit as an exploitation of proletariat by the wealthy people. It's a justification for a communist revolution to abolish the destroying capitalist system in erecting socialism. The exact same analytical theory. So, the exact. Fast forward 40 years later, you have the marginal productivity theory of distribution uh, that was developed predominantly by two guys, Philip Wicksteed in England, who was a socialist, non Marxian socialist, but so a socialist nevertheless, a brilliant economist, and John Bates Clark in America, who started as a socialist and became some kind of middle of the road, wishy washy, social democrat, social liberal, or something. Uh, Marginal productivity theory says that, that labor and capital and all other factors of production are remunerated according to their marginal, their contribution to marginal value. And in their, in their point, from their point of view, that's a perfectly reasonable theory that's consistent with capitalism as well as with social. And then it was 20 or 30 years later. Then people who were the equivalent of Karl Marx came along and say, oh, you for Mises, for example, say, you know what you did, guys, here. You actually provided the justification for free market capitalism. You provided a justification or explanation of the best possible elaboration of the thesis that market wages that took paid on the free market by capitalists are just wages. The distribution of income created by a free market system is just a fair distribution. A thought that would have never occurred in, in their entire life to either feel Christian or John Bates Clark. The same, the exact same dynamic. We have the analytical content of the theory, marginal productivity theory, and then the, inter the ideological political interpretation of the theory. So you have always this uh, going, going back to trying to kind of um, clarify this point. What is crucial and important for you as students of the history of economic ideas is to pay attention primarily and predominantly to this internal evolution of, of the ideas, the analytical content, the economic analysis, and to kind of bracket out, at least for a while, political implications, ideological but to ignore them as much as possible. Of course, I will always in this introductory part tell you something about the thinker, about his biography, or about the political context of the time and so on, but that's not what was most important. It may be just necessary for you to better understand the connections between, between economic theories and, and the context, but what counts is really the ideas. But the ideas have their independent evolution, their independent logic that sometimes or very often doesn't Correspond with the evolution of political ideas. Okay, so enough of me and my pontificating of Adam Smith. Let's now jump into, into the text and see what are some of the main ideas that you found. Adam Smith is a pretty much pretty clear writer. There shouldn't be major problems in understanding the context. So, what are the main points that you found interesting? So it begins actually literally at the beginning of the, of the old gigantic book, 700 pages or something. This chapter one on the definition of labor, that's literally the very beginning, the first page of the book. So the division of labor, the book begins with discussing the problem of division of labor. So what he says here, and why is that important? Why do you understand it? Are there any problems that you encounter here? What is the significance of this theory of division of labor? Please. There's one example that he uses here, one illustration of the problem. 
Factory. Okay. Talks about a pin maker. Yeah, the pin factory, the famous needle factory example. Right? So what is the what is the beat for that? Just it, I mean it reminds me of like the eye pencil too. It's just like how without one person like specializing in one aspect of the creation of the pin, they would make just like so few pins. And because one person gets really good at one thing in the processor, they're able to create thousands of more compared to mm -hmm. if they have all just tried doing the whole thing on their own. Yeah, so you can have the same five people with the same production techniques, and the same level of knowledge. If they specialize, they can produce together in a specialized fashion much more than if everybody tried to produce everything in the beginning. So specialization of division of labor, splitting up the task into, into multiple stages of multiple discrete pieces and assigning different people to perform different tasks is productive. Those people as a team can produce much more than if everybody worked along. So you remember that we analyzed the exchange and okay, okay, okay we'll go back to that later. Okay, I don't want to use this. Uh, okay, what are the reasons for, for this period of theory? Yeah. 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 So improvement of the dexterity of the workman necessarily increases the quantity of the work he can perform. And the division of labor by reducing every man's business to some one simple operation and by making this operation the sole employment of his life necessarily increases very much the dexterity of the work. This idea you can specialize in one thing and you can perform it better because you have more time to learn and perfect your performance. So you can do much more good at this one task than you could have done in, on five additional, five separate tasks. So that's one thing. Secondly, saving time. So from passing from one task to another, you're saving time and increasing productivity that way. You need, as a team, less time to produce a single unit of uh, of a product, and there is a specialization in division of labor, then, then there is not. And then with technology, so he says that he's a subtle argument here that machinery and equipment is a part and parcel of every production process. And very often, productivity requires a better use of a given machine. There is no kind of once and for all given way in which you're going to be using any machine or a piece of equipment and so on. So gradual discoveries of new ways of utilizing the existing machinery or the, uh, introducing a different kind of machinery are necessary for increasing productivity. So he already senses this idea of a relationship between technology and progress. But he has there's an addition, additional angle here. Only if you allow somebody to specialize in using machinery and equipment, or maybe thinking about technological improvements, he or she will have a greater chance of stumbling upon, stumbling upon a, some new discovery or slightly tweaking the old way of doing things so as to improve the so as to improve the productivity. That's another way, actually. This division of labor um, uh, incentivizes or encourages better use of technical equipment or machinery. So that's the, these are the three independent sources of um, productivity or, or specialization in other states fields. Improved dexterity and capability of performing the work, saving time, and then improving the quality and the application of technological means production. Okay, so that's it. That's simple. Now, straightforward. 
Now, how? That's another important issue. To see how the Adam Smith establishes this analysis of the market and fleshes out for the first time maybe this problem, major philosophical problem in the markets, that you have a system that looked as an intelligent system, intelligent design system, which means that it produces the results that seem desirable, increases productivity, increases wealth, reduces prices, and so on. It looks like something that is designed and created. And yet the way how we reach that result is not designed, is not created, is a spontaneous order. So one term that one of the followers and, and uh, let's say, uh, economists writing widely speaking in this meeting tradition, Hayek, he said that this is a concept of a spontaneous order. In which individual decisions of people who are not guided by any superior intelligence or political dictation make choices that result in something that looks like an intelligent design. And you can find the traces or the germs rather of this way of thinking and awareness of, of the character of the free market, paradoxical character of the free market is the system that. It is intelligent, but it is not designed. But Adam Smith, one of the examples, one of the illustrations of this awareness of, 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 of the free character of the free market is this idea of gradual discovery. You allow people to experiment with different things and then you discover step by step a better use for technology, or better ways of employing the machine. So there is no one like a, like a king or a queen or, or, or a tax collector for the king who can know what a man on the spot or a woman on the spot can do with a given machine in a free factory. They have to discover what is the best use of the machine, what is the most efficient way of producing things. And we can discover that only if you allow people to experiment and if you allow people to make mistakes. As you have to allow liberty. You see, how the concept of economic liberty is not an ideological imposition from the board and say everybody should be free and free market and we don't want government intervention. It's not like that. It's a, it's a from the bottom up analysis. It says we, we, we need a way to discover what is the best way of satisfying consumers and we cannot know that if we don't try every one of us individual in a variety of different ways. And that's that's the that's the that's the description of the market. So that's one way, experimenting with the machines. Another aspect, another expression of this view of the market as a spontaneously evolving, spontaneously emerging system is how we reach a stage of division of labor, specialization. Why and how is specialization means? Anyone notice that? That's chapter two. Yes, so the principle which gives occasion to division of labor. The very first sentence gives you a preliminary answer. So, what do you make of that? What he wants to essentially emphasize. This division of labor, from which so many advantages are derived. What are those advantages? Higher productivity, wealth, and so on. So we have many advantages that looks like an intelligence system that is designed for our benefit. It is not originally the effect of any human wisdom. There is no philosopher or a king or a priest somewhere who said, you know, we need to do this because that's good for us. Any human wisdom which foresees and intends the general of that general opulence to which it gives occasion. There was no agency inventing division of labor because that, that agency of intelligence or a king or, a, or an economist planned division of labor to be created and, and to occasion, occasion as we said, in wealth. It is the necessary now, he's, he's positive about what gives rise to. 
it is the necessary division of labor, though very slow, very slow and gradual consequence of a certain propensity in human nature, which has in view no such extensive utility. So this propensity has no in view this uh, doesn't intend to produce this general utility for everybody. This this result of increasing wealth, increasing productivity, and so on. The propensity to truck, to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. That's what gives occasion to division of labor. And how does it give occasion? How does na nature of propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another encourages division of labor? Because remember, both micro and macro economics, when we draw when we do two curves like this. Remember that we have two guys with two different interactions with this curve. Curves and one can make butter better than another one can make bread better than they can choose what to do with their labor time. If one of them tries to do both things, he can create less bread and butter than he can get if he specializes in one of them and then exchanges the surpluses with the other guy. So that's nature of propensity to talk about barter and extension. Perceiving that I can get more if I specialize in this, that people want to buy from me butter, so I'm going to be specializing in that, I'm going to be producing that. So the occasion is the germ, the, the initial uh, let's say the impetus for specialization that gives rise to specialization is it is realization that I can earn economic wealth some kind or another by offering other people something in exchange. It's natural propensity to exchange. Truck bar barter is not the nature of uh, the direct exchange. So that's the most primitive form of exchange. We have also, of course, later on, indirect or monetary exchange. So, see, it's just an individual profit seeking, in a, in a very broad, neutral sense, profit seeking activity, in the sense of some gain that you can get. Not the profit in a technical account, in the sense of a corporation having or not having a profit, but the benefit. Individual benefit is the only driving force. I don't have in mind when I decide to to make bread and exchange it for new butter. I don't have in mind any grandiose scheme of social cooperation, any results that will come about as a consequence of that in 10 years or 15 years. So when Robinson Crusoe and, and Friday on a desert island started to exchange fruit for, 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 for corn, they didn't have in mind modern. 21st century technology. They just wanted to get by and to, to be better off. And otherwise, they didn't have any. So that's what, 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 what he wants to emphasize here that this propensity for exchanging stuff and bartering stuff and cooperating with other people is what creates division of labor, and that you don't need any external coercion. Any external planning and masterminding and control people in order to make them behave in a way which produces wealth and appeal to society. So that's the beginning of the analysis. That's another aspect of Adam Smith's analysis of the market. That it shows this keen awareness of this basic fact that the market is a system that is intelligent but not intelligently designed. He's a, he's a major critic of this idea of intelligent design in economics. There is somebody who is home. There is somebody who controls the process. Now, the most famous, uh, let's say, general formulation of this same principle. Is found on page 183. 
is a part, it's a part of the discussion of foreign trade and international trade theory, and we'll come back to it in a moment. But now this particular one of the particular sentences here is crucial as a as a reflection of the same awareness of the character, spontaneous character of the narrative. He says, as every individual, therefore, it's the very beginning of the, of, of the page, the second sentence, endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry and so to direct that industry that it, its produce must be of the greatest value. Every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest, but nor knows how much he is promoting. By preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, he intends only his own security. And by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was not part of his intention. Nor is it is always the worst for the society that it was not part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he, is, when he really intends to promote. I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. Listen to this. Not many modern economists or modern economic journalists or political activists or analysts of corporations and private firms would agree with this. That's a corporate social responsibility. You want to tell them that it's not useful? It does seem to suggest that. It is an affectation indeed, not very common among merchants, and very few words need be employed in this way they can comment. That was the case in the 18th century. I'm not sure whether it's the case nowadays. He says, it's much more effectively, public interest is much more effectively served by selfish people pursuing their own self-interest rather than by trying to pretend that you're working for public good. And selfish people, selfish businessmen act as if, as if, this is the key place. Sometimes people ridicule this invisible hand metaphor, uh, insinuating that Adam Smith involves some kind of divine providence here. That God's hand literally drives everybody to create art and so on. He is very careful. He doesn't say that. He says, as if they were driven by an invisible hand to create the effect that is not part of the beneficial part. It doesn't literally say that there is some secret divine camp that drives merchants and businessmen to create harm. It says that it might look that way if you don't understand fully how the economic system works. So this is this is the phrase, this is the key, this key sentence that everybody quotes from the wealth of nations, this invisible hand. Theorem or invisible hand uh, principle that Smith develops. Okay, what about theory of value? Labor theory of value and cost of production. Can you tell me something about that? So it would be chapters three and six. Seven.
Mm -hmm. says that there's three things that make up a price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are the what are those? wages, profit, and rent. Wages, profit, and rent. So these are what are these? How do you define? How does you define? Right? Um, so this is the famous 3R, another thing that analytical uh, tool that Adam Smith wages, profit, rent. These are de facto incomes. Incomes that accrue to different uh, productive agents. Wages to workers, profit to entrepreneurs, and rents to landlords. These are costs of production. So costs of production determine price. But then the next page, 178. It says, second paragraph. The real value of all different component parts of price, it must be observed, is measured by the quantity of labor which they can, each of them, purchase or command. Labor measures the value not only of that part of price which resolves in itself into labor, wages, but the labor is a universal measure of value for all three, for all three. But of that which resolves itself into rent, and that which resolves itself into profit. In every society, the price of every commodity finally resolves itself into some one or, or other, or all of those three parts. And in every improved society, all the three enter more or less as a component part into the price of the far greater part of commodities. So see, Adam Smith's theory of value is twofold. For a primitive society in which there is no money, there is no exchange. It's a pure labor theory problem. That means the value, the exchange value of a given good will be determined by the amount of labor invested in production. In, a, in an economy which is deviated by money and market, it's the theory of cost of production. The exchange value, the price will be determined by these new components, wages, profits, and rents, how much money is necessary to produce. Profit compensation for capital investment, rent is a compensation for providing land, and wages are compensation for labor. And the, the Direction of causation is here from these to price. Cost determines price. In the primitive theory of labor, determines price or the exchange value involved. In a modern economy, complex market economy is the cost of production, which it involves, in addition to wages, also profit and rents. So, in Adam Smith, it is this dual theory of, of value. For a primitive society, it is the labor theory of value. For a more advanced society, the cost of production. David Ricardo will go back to some kind of synthetic theory that is based essentially on labor cost of production theory, or that Marx will. It's kind of combination of this. We will see next time when we read the cup what exactly it means. Okay. But at any rate, both of these theories are objective theories of value, which means that the value of uh, 
good is determined by objective factors pertaining to that good, the amount of labor that is necessary to produce it, or the cost of production necessary. He says then in this chapter seven, he says, what is the nature of price? Nature of price of uh, any commodity is a price that corresponds to some average costs of production. Ordinary or average rates may be called the natural rates of trade, profit, and rent. Because then the question arises, what is the what is the rate rate, 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 or rate what is the profit rate what is the rent they may vary from time to time from place to place and adam smith found this what is it, this solomon solution here both david ricardo and especially karl marx will replicate whenever in doubt average Whenever you don't know how to solve a problem theoretically, create an average and you solve the problem. Okay, so it's the average then. In some area, it's 6%, in some area, it's 4%, in some area, it's 7%. Let's average it out, and then that's nature of rate of profit. So then, nature of price of a thing is a price that corresponds to average rates of return on factor, on labor, capital, and life. So that's the nature of nature of price. That's a long term option, sometimes we call it equilibrium price. So prices may jump up and down, depart from the average. Remember, remember Cantillon has the same similar idea. It's the labor theory of value, and then consumers may make they make the fluctuations of prices go slightly up and down and so on. But there is a long term average, long term average. But even this is not completely original theory. Right? Even this is kind of taken over from the French tradition. But he rejects the local labor theory about this cost of production. That's a new thing. So now, what is the problem with this? A simple problem with this is how to explain, okay. Let's assume that this is indeed the case. How to explain a very high value of some goods, very high exchange value, goods that are not produced, profound nature, expensive, where the diamonds of gold that you find, paintings. And how much, how much money Van Gogh or, 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 or Rubens paid for, for the paint and brushes and, and the material and how many hours they spent. When you add all that up, it's an infinitesimal fraction of the market value that the, that the painting commands. So he, he was he was aware of this. I was making in other parts of the book he writes about it. He says, oh, this is kind of problem. Because if you if you want to develop the theory of value, you you have to be capable of explaining the exchange value of all goods and services, not only of some of them. Even if those that you think you can explain are more important. And what solutions that both Smith and later Ricardo found was to say, okay, these are the exceptions that are unimportant. They call them scarcity rules. So they kind of hint at the marginal theory of, of value, but they leave it for that. So it's a scarcity rules, there's just a few of them, and they're so expensive. But what we as economists are interested in, yeah, here is an important point here. We as economists are interested in production of material value. We are not interested in prices of everything. We are interested in understanding what creates material value, industrial goods, agricultural goods. That's what we are after. Understanding the process of production and exchange. Not value in the abstract. So from that standpoint, 
Oh, okay. Uh, Van Gogh's paintings are not very important. It's important how we understand the price of, I just want to say cars, not carriages, <laughs> or prices of uh, chocolate cakes, prices of books, whatever articles were in high demand at that time. So that was the quote unquote solution that they found for this paradox. Paradox of value. You cannot explain the prices of, of some goods by using the theory that you utilize to explain most of the prices, prices of industrial produced goods. Two more things. Uh, this is a point. point. Uh, can somebody briefly explain this? This this phrase. Uh, the division of labor is determined by the extent of the market. Is limited. Yeah, the division of labor is limited only by the extent of the market. What does he mean? Yes, so it's not like the amount of capital that the uh, society has available. Okay. And I know he kind of talked about monopolies for a second too. I think yeah, he talks about monopoly in the context of tariffs and, and trade protections. Uh, you're giving a monopoly uh, to flow into the degree to companies that are protected from foreign competition. Is the extent of the market why why there is a better offer of restaurants or foreign food in New York than in Brisbane? That's the, that's the question that we have to ask. Uh, the, the fact that there is a better offering, more diverse offering of restaurants or foreign food is, 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 uh, is evidence that the division, degree of division of labor in New York is larger in, in that area as, as well as in many other areas. Well. I use maybe a wrong example. I'm not sure anymore where where is that in the right now. Let's say uh, Miami, Miami, Florida. Miami, Miami, Florida. Is there all? Is this in Europe? That, that they want to crucify the New York government who offered that. Okay. Let's forget about politics at this moment. So why is that the case? In Miami, Florida, is better offering. And what one of those offerings of restaurants in the quarter one of offer, yeah, just first and then and then I just end. Uh, go ahead. Like at the market becomes more expensive, <coughs> so the division of labor. So like you said an example of a farmer, like there's no market for it. A farmer has to be their own we say yeah, he has to be a bank, <coughs> their own bank and their own food, their own um, <coughs> there's no one to if you, you can't specialize in the yeah. market. Yeah, if you have in Bismarck, you have a limited number of people, so you cannot make everybody work in, in the restaurant industry. So you have whatever, 100 people who will work there, so they will satisfy the most pressing need first. I, I doubt that the demand for Korean food will be, will be number one. Probably there will be some local food or something, or maybe Italian food, maybe Chinese or something, but it will be more why? Because of the, of the limited extent of the market, the limited number of people who can work in that industry. Larger the number of people, larger the size of the market, more, av more available or more uh, greater the benefits of the division of labor. Four of us can produce, if just four of us work in the restaurant business, we can maybe create four restaurants. If everybody, if all eight of us enter the market, we can potentially create. The very simple fact that there's more people in Miami for it will create a better opportunity to interior of this restaurant in this that, that, that would, what it means to say that division of labor is limited only by the extent of the market. What he means is actually the, by the number of people who participate. Greater the, the number of people who participate in the division of labor, greater the benefits of mutual exchange. The greater the benefits of mutual exchange. You can get more goods and services in that because they're more diverse goods and services. 
So one, one aspect is that eight of us can specialize in eight different things, and create eight different types of restaurants for consumers who then have a wider choice. But if there's another effect here, competition. Even if we don't decide, if four of them don't decide to open up new types of restaurants, they will compete against four of us in the same line of business. Maybe offering a better Korean food or a better Italian food. So both of these work uh, as a benefit of the regional factor. Larger the size, larger the number of people, more things could be done, more things could be produced, more different things could be produced. Number one, and number two, the existing things might be produced better than cheaper because of higher competition. There you have your theory, the basis of the theory of international trade. That's what it is. Chinese and Americans, free trade between America and China simply means that you, the extent of the market is larger. You can tap on a greater number of people for both of these effects. Increasing the quality, quality pressure of competition and increasing diversity of production. Simple as that. And on the key, Parallel, two parallels here. Page 188, that Royce mentioned. To give the monopoly of the home market to the producer of domestic industry, that means to give the, to, to protect the domestic firms against foreign competition by subsidies, by tariffs, or both. In any particular art of manufacturing, is in some measure to direct private people in what manner they ought to employ their capitals, and must in almost all cases be either a useless or a hurtful regulation. If the produce of domestic can be brought there as cheap as that of foreign industry, the regulation is evidently useless. You don't need a tariff if domestic goods are cheaper than foreign goods. Why would you import that? If it cannot, it must generally be hurtful. It is the maxim of every prudent master of a family never to attempt to make at home what it will cost him more to make than to buy. So you don't make your own shoes, you buy your shoes because the shoemaker can make it cheaper and you can do something else that you cannot, that you can better, that you can make cheaper or better than the shoemaker. The tailor does not attempt to make his own shoes but buys them of the shoemaker. The shoemaker does not attempt to make his own clothes but employs the tailor. The farmer attempts to make neither the one or the other but employs all different artifices. All of them find it for their interest to employ their whole industry in a way in which they have some advantage over their neighbors. What is prudence in the conduct now is the key, is the key switch, is the key transition from the theory of its abstract, pedestrian, simple, seemingly simple minded theory of, of uh, division of labor to international trade. This is one of the key sentences made in the entire book. What is prudence in the conduct of every family life? Uh, every private family, can scarce be falling in debt of a great king. If a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy of them with some part of the produce of our own industry employed in a way in which we have some advantage. The general industry of the country being always in proportion to the capital which employs it, will not thereby be diminished, no more than that of the above mentioned artificers. Here. He draws the exact parallel, the exact identity between shoe shoemaker, tailor, and farmer, and domestic and foreign producers of, of the same group. Remember this example. It says, "Oh yes, we can make we can make uh, wine in Scotland." Remember that example. Of course, we can make it at three times the cost uh, that, that it takes in Frenchmen and Italians. So what is the problem there? Yeah, we, we, we can make our domestic work right, but we would be wasting resources and labor and capital that we can employ more productively elsewhere instead of, instead of trying to produce everything for ourselves. So see, this whole theory, this is now you recognize the motifs of economic theory. Uh, that is now the textbook wisdom. This is the place where it comes from. This is the, the entire third part of the book, 200 pages in the article, the meticulous dissection of all mercantilist 
theories and, and a defense of this uh, free trade theory based on the division of labor and benefits of specialization. Okay, that will be pretty much the time got for today. Do you have any questions or comments? Actually, thank you for it is where they get the idea of comparative language. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You see, David Ricardo, David Ricardo was uh, responsible for the first formulation of the principle of comparative language. So you see that Adam Smith uses the what is the principle? We can make it cheaper with less uh, less labor. He uses labor as a, and, and uh, David Ricardo will use the same principle. We can, we can, we can make the product cheaper. So to measure the, the criterion of of comparative advantage. He doesn't use the term comparative advantage, but he uses the concept. Because the concept is whether we can make something cheaper that, that our, our workers can make something cheaper than this. As we have a comparative advantage. We'll see the theory of comparative advantage, all three, the, the version that we learn in micro and macro courses is the most up to date version of the 20th century, developed by Gottfried Haberwood on last time. So we'll come to that. David Ricardo is, is the he was responsible for the formulation of the first uh, complete model of comparative labor. But Haberler eliminated this labor theory value and, and based the comparative advantage theory on, on um, subjective marginal value. This derivation of, of um, comparative advantage from two production possibilities curves and then analyzing the opportunity cost, whoever can produce it more opportunity cost than the comparative advantage, that's how the right perfect test that we will learn in micro and macro. The that we is the newest, newest one. So not neither Smith nor Ricard nor Ricard will be responsible for it. Okay, other questions? Go ahead. Uh, so Ricardo will be next. So a reflection is due on Thursday. Yeah. Okay, I will postpone it for later on. So we will read Ricardo on Thursday. So I will move it for Sunday, for example. So I don't know why you guys post it for. So it's the next reflection is on Sunday. So uh, next next reader that you want us to be to read about is David Ricardo. Yeah, I think that it should be David Ricardo. Oh, um, it, 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 it says it's Robert Ma 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 Maltus. No, Ricardo. Ricardo. Ricardo first, and then we will read. We will read next week. Malthus and Jean Baptiste say okay. they they debated it, so that, that would be nice. So these three guys, Ricardo, Malthus, and Jean Baptiste say, we're going back and forth so debating all kinds of things. So this is going to be funny because they are in, in constant uh, discussion among themselves. Okay.